معاكم ونلقاكم على البودكاست اللوم اللي ما عندي بنيه دام فير انتريسانتي زقور لهاي القطكم بنيه دام اللي ما يعيش مالتا يعيش برا بين مالتا هي دلنا الستوريا تياو ودان هو بيرسونا اللي هو رسلر برا من مالتا قبل شين قبل نبدا البروجرام انهجشكم باش تعملوا سبسكرايب واليوتيوب شانل تاعنا باش بك تكونوا نوتيفيكاتي كل بروجرام اللي احنا يكولنا جيمس كيف انتي؟ اول رايت اول رايت كيف انتي؟ استنى انا بس نوتشالي حتى راني احيار ايوه جيمس انتي هنقرا داك شين فتيت من حفنا فريت اللي تعمل انتي اتليتا برو رسلر اكتر ستانت مان فايت سين كووردينيتر او رايتر وكل ايوه او انتي تديشندنسا مالتيا ذاتس رايت تستا تيدنا داك شي انتي من انتي جيمس اول رايت ا غراسي هافنا ين هوبيت شي هافنا باش نتكلم بيا Ian is Simo, James de Jean Bonavilla. I wrestle under the name Malta the Damager. I'm a dual citizen of Malta in America. Um, I just turned 50 years old this year. I'm still active pro wrestler around the world. Um, I, my tag team partner, Wayne Patch, who, who wrestles under the name Johnny Valletta, who if you haven't interviewed him, let me suggest that you interview him as well. because yeah, he's a, he's an awesome guy and he's uh he's ranked number five in Japan in pro wrestling wow. and that's a pretty big deal for the guys like us that do it he also founded a company in Malta called pro wrestling Malta mm-hmm. and they do shows there but anyway I was born here in uh, New York in 1971 I've traveled back and forth 24 times since 1973 so I remember Malta the old Malta, I, you know, I'm, my, my family, uh, our, our village is in Berzabuja. We have a flat there because uh, my, it belonged to my grandparents and they left it to us. And um, yeah, uh, Malta is, 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 is my descent. And being that I was raised in New York, uh, everybody in New York is from different places, whether, you know, you're, black or you are Spanish or you are Greek or Italian or Irish or German or Jewish or Asian or Indian or whoever you are, uh, people are very proud of their culture, you know, which is why I spend a lot of time learning about Malta, the history of Malta and the, and the Maltese culture. And the more that I dug into it, the, the more proud that I was to be Maltese, to be a descendant of Maltese, to be a Maltese American. Um, you know, we have some of the oldest history in the world. You tell people, yeah, I'm from Malta. They say, what is that? Malta Goya, Malta India? Because over here, they sell drinks called Malta, <laughs> right? And they're like a little malted drink. Spanish people drink them a lot. But I'm like, no, it's not a drink. Then they say, I says, I'm Maltese. They says, oh, like the Maltese dog. And I said, no, I'm not. a. I'm not a dog. I said, yes, but it's Maltese, like the name of the Maltese dog, but Maltese is a people. I said, are you a Christian? They go, yeah. I said, do you ever read the Bible? Everybody says, yeah, but nobody reads the Bible. Right? <laughs> They said, oh, yeah, yeah, I read the Bible. I said, well, there's a story in there where St. Paul is pioneering Christianity, and he gets shipwrecked in Malta in a place now that's known as St. Paul's Bay, and he started one of the oldest churches in the world in St. Paul's Cave. Mm-hmm. So Maltese people are some of the oldest Christians in the world. Uh, we have, uh, you know, a, a history that's unparalleled to anybody's history, the oldest history. You know, when people were talking about Malta joining Europe and not joining Europe, uh, there is no Europe without Malta. Europe begins in Malta. The history of Europe begins in Malta. So whether you join this or join that and, you know, I, I, I hate that um, everybody is so uh, red or blue or, you know, nationalist or, or um, you know. The Labour when, Party. Or the Labour Party. I, I hate that because people are, are 
not voting on policies anymore. They're just voting on down party lines and, and the people don't benefit for stuff like that, mm-hmm. you know? So I, I, I don't like the politics, you know, to me, you shouldn't be red or blue in Malta. You should be purple, man. Everybody should be together for the sake of Malta, the Maltese people, the Maltese culture, and the things that makes Malta Malta. I mean, we have James, Maltese met, citizens. Meta nesse mark, new ghost nesse mark. Ash hafna mel Maltin stes. Uh huh. Momish proud, das ke minte proud, enti li enti descendente Malti. Right. Sometimes people don't understand what they have. Mm-hmm. When you when you're there, you don't appreciate it. I know many people who leave Malta and they go work abroad and they go to other countries and they can't wait to save every penny. They won't even buy an underwear or a socks so they can go back and live in Malta and retire early because you appreciate it more if you leave what you have. Malta is one of the most beautiful places on the entire planet. It's the oyster of the world as far as I'm concerned. It's right now, it's being overpopulated, overrun, overdeveloped. Um, they're taking away the charm of the island. My friend Dominic Bartolo Jr. is one of my oldest friends in Malta. You know, when they built the Porto Maso Hilton, and I even know the guy who built it, all right? Because um, they took me through it as they were building it. And uh, it was a relation married to one of my cousins, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I, I wasn't happy to see that. I'm not happy to see, like, you know, You think people are going to now go to Malta, which was like everything preserved for so many years, all the, uh, everything, antiki taveru, you know, everything nice. The, the churches and the cathedrals were the skyscrapers, you know, and, and that was the landscape. That was the, the skyline of Malta. Now it's uh, becoming a metropolis. Mm-hmm. So i mean, the people think that they you want to go to Malta for the beaches, for the the nice, charming towns and villages and the feasts and, and for the megalithic structures and temples and the history and all the fortifications and castles and towers and all this beautiful, beautiful stuff in Malta. Now it's going to be overshadowed by the, like, I'll give you an example. Right. Bears of Buja. When my grandfather built the place there, there was no free port. The the sea water used to come all the way up to Johnny's Bar and Cherries over there. The sea used to come all the way to the road. And then they said when they approved to build over there, where they built the free port, first they said they were going to build a yacht marina. And then they turned it into Jurassic Park. My cousin Simon, he calls it Jurassic Park. Mm. You know, and it, and uh, in that place, in Malta, in the south of the island, there it was one of the quiet, most beautiful, desirable place to live. There's so many areas where there's nothing and you want to build the free port right there. Well, whatever it is, but it overshadows the neighborhood, you know, when you go, when you go to that side. And the same thing that's happening to the landscape in Malta, it's kind of being overshadowed by by too much building and overpopulation. O di ki awa da me differenti le right inti per esli ti gi spes Malta u kol le gi viri inti jait Malta erba washrin darba o kol darba de em tara bidla differenti gi viri right tifta kar Malta quasi quasi da si inti gi viri even from four years ago it changed so much now they have all these flyover. Mm-hmm. Highways to Valletta from Bersabuja. I mean, it's it's very, very different. And in many ways, it's 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 changing um the landscape. You know, it's it no, it's it's like for instance, now you got the flyover, now everybody's gonna be sitting in Floriana sooner to wait to get to park their car to go to Valletta. So you're yeah. just gonna get there faster. The mm-hmm. way they designed the roads in Malta wasn't stupid it was smart because if you go straight you'll be in the end of Malta in two seconds mm-hmm. so you know there was all these winding roads and roundabouts so you don't go to where you're going to in two seconds otherwise you'll be every you'll be there in two, two minutes you know with with straight street so it was smart and it, and it, that slows down the pace of the of the now when you fly over and everybody gets there soon there's just more people waiting to get in oh, cool. but you know I, I know that there's a lot of like different like the things that I don't like in Malta 
and I don't like it in New York. And I tell people all the time, um, you know, they had riots here and, 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 and bad politics and people tote the word racism. And like, I grew up um, in Queens, New York in Astoria, and I used to live right outside the projects. And uh, I know what, what real racism is and what real racism is. And there's no real racism in Malta. Mm -hmm. Maltese people, it's impossible for anybody to be a racist because the people, our people itself is built up of many cultures, of many different people. Even the language is built up of many cultures, of many different people. So how are you gonna say you're a racist because you don't want um, to give away the land that your, my grandfather fought in World War II in the Royal Air Force, my Nunu Nazi. He was also, you know, he served the Archbishop Gazi at the time when the Church of England was in control of Malta. And it was the equivalent to being like the bodyguard to the president. He used to walk in St. John's Cathedral before him holding the icon. He was the driver, he hosted Queen Elizabeth, he hosted popes, he was in the Vatican. He, all, you know, all Cardinal Spellman, I have a picture over here with him and Cardinal Spellman driving in Valletta after the bombardments and stuff like that. So, uh, and you know, they, my grandfather tells me the stories during World War II uh, where he was awarded the Maltese Cross as a medal, my, my grandfather, mm -hmm. because uh, he was a commander and a bomb fell and he jumped on top of his platoon of guys and took shrap metal from the bottom of his foot into the back of his head to protect his men. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, he was just, a, my grandfather was a real man's man. I don't even know if you're allowed to say that anymore. I'll say it because I don't, I don't really care what people think. You know, everybody's too touchy. Everybody's too moody. You know, we but, need, we, all need, story we, need to, my we need to, we need to, you know, everybody needs to embrace the things that makes us different. And, uh, but at the same time, you need to preserve what's yours. People didn't fight the, everybody from the, you know, being a part of the Roman empire, the Ottomans, the French, the, the Germans and the Italians, people didn't die. And my, my grandfather's brother and, and his wife died and several of their kids and one survived and he raised her with the kids. And, you know, people didn't give their blood, sweat and tears. He was saying during the time in World War II, because they blocked all the trade coming in, they couldn't even get a piece of beef. You couldn't get any imported food. You went with the fishing pole. If you didn't catch nothing, you wouldn't even go home to face your family there starving. So this is the sacrifice. This is the reason why, in my opinion, they shouldn't take Malta and just give it to anybody who comes floating in to Delhi Mara. You know, I agree with you, James. I, I agree with you. And uh, I'm not, not sympathetic to anybody's needs, mm -hmm. but a lot of the things that has happened, picture it the other way, that if you were floating over that way, would they take you in? Mm -hmm. Will they assimilate you? Were yes. they going to give you pocket money? Are they going to shoot you down in the water? What are they going to do? You know, who will we save at that time? There's mm -hmm. so many different things going on. And I see that, like over here, we had the riots in the streets. And I was interviewed by Fabio D'Amicoli because um, they heard that I made the news over here. I fought off about 30 guys trying to loot a store downstairs in my building here. Because mm -hmm. I live above the store. If they set it on fire, I'm going to lose my place. And I don't believe that when things like this happen, everybody should stay in the house and let 200 people come down. There's millions of people here. In order to stop it, all you have to do is walk downstairs and stand together. Mm -hmm. Now the 150, 200 people are going to ransack the whole city and everybody just let them, including the police. You know, mm -hmm. it's like they said with the insurrection that happened here during Trump's speech. You ever seen anything like it? They tell you it's an insurrection. Meanwhile, they open the doors. They let the people in. The, 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 um, the, the Washington police and the, and the national police are over there. They don't even pull a gun and tell the guy, stop. Everybody's walking past them, taking selfies. This is all staged Hollywood um, antagonist, anarchist, people who want to disrupt people. Uh, these shutdowns, 
have made a certain few people rich and made everybody else poor. Just when everybody was catching up to the same, to, to a comfortable level for everybody. Now it's this like forced divide. They let people write graffiti, let people, it's, to me, it's like a stage thing. And I see it happening in Malta and I don't like it at all. You know, everybody should be proud of who they are, where they're from, what makes them different. And uh, like America, when they used to think like that here, everybody used to come forever from everywhere. And they were all under the American flag and they put their brains together and they built something nice. Mm -hmm. Now everybody comes here so they can separate themselves under a different flag. Whatever, whatever the flag is, whether it's the, the uh, gay flag or it's a Black Lives Matter flag or it's a Blue Lives flag or it's a, everybody's got a flag here. Whatever happened to us all being under the same flag? And, and, and that's also as well true, like, you know, in Malta as well. But Malta, I love it. It's the, most, it's the oyster of, the, of Europe. It's the most beautiful place in the world for me. I've been there 20, 24 times. And I was just there two months ago. I did a wrestling show in Paola, in uh, the Palace Theater there. And uh, we had a very good event considering it was after COVID, but it was, a, it was a, a full, the maximum capacity allowed. Everybody supports it. Pro wrestling is growing in Malta. How was, was it inspired. affected with, with COVID, James? What? How was it affected with COVID? When you take the... Uh... I- Thing. Can oh, you hear me, on. James? I, I got to pick up this other call, man. I'm... Okay, okay, no problem, James. Give me one second. No problem. Um, konna din nitkelmu fuq Malta l-affarijiet l-affarijiet kemm tuħu gost kif qed inbidel id-dinja wkoll u ċertu affarijiet li rridu nkunu iktar uniti flimkien kif ġi mela ħanibdew hekk qabel nibdew kif ġi affettwat ir-wrestling ħabba l-Covid ejja nibdew daqsxejn kif ġi l-interess biex tidħol wrestler all right so uh, basically, the COVID is was shut down all all arena sports, including professional wrestling. Now, McMahon WWE is such a big part of the economy here in America that they were allowed to still continue their program, but without a live audience. Instead, they put up they had their performance center and they put up like uh, flat screen TVs, and the fans would pay to have their pitch, have them live watching the thing from the TV. So they found a way around it. And uh, for me, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been really busy no matter what. You know, I, I took COVID serious to a certain degree, all right? The, and what I mean about that is this, like there's a lot of homeless people in here in New York, all right? They're on the street there. I know a lot of them out here that they, they not wearing a mask, smoking cigarettes off the floor that people throw out. They're drinking from the same bottle and there's more of them. They're not less of them, you know? So it's not the black plague of Europe. It's not the sky is fallen, chicken little, you know? The truth of the matter of COVID is that before they had a vaccine, people went and got tested and had COVID and they didn't even know they had it. Some people could could get COVID and not even know it. It won't affect you at all. So do you need to have this vaccine, that vaccine, especially like I, I had a, a, a side effect from the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. I had 17 profusious nosebleeds, all right? And then I had to have my nose cauterized. And then, and then I had to have it cauterized the second time. And then after that, where my tonsils was removed, I started bleeding from there, which is unrelated to my nose. So the only thing that happened was a day before I got the vaccine and then I had all of these bleeds. Mm -hmm. So uh, I worked during the vaccine. I wrestled during the vaccine. We filmed the movie (laughs) out in the streets because we kind of saw it as opportunity. We filmed in Times Square. We filmed on the Brooklyn Bridge. We filmed on, on, on the Williamsburg Bridge. There wasn't nobody out there. I thought that it was 
something in time that, like I says, I weighed the risk and we went out there and we filmed the, something that's on up on YouTube called NAX Crossroads. And it's basically an inspirational video uh, done by this company that I run, NAX North American Experience, uh, where the, like, the wrestlers are perceived like superheroes, real life superheroes from the comic books come to life. You know, they have nice physiques, nice you know costumes and stuff like that and they inspire people so in this movie short film that we made it's an inspirational video for people to come out after the lockdown and resume their lives as normal and it has a very good message in it that's good like i says um that that the world needs to hear today it's like all the things that make us different really now more than ever, it has to be the glue that holds us together. Mm -hmm. You can't say it's different. You're entitled to like or not like something. People are entitled to like or not like you, not or not like me, not like or like what I say. But this mentality that everybody's got to think the same way, otherwise you're the problem. This is like communism mm -hmm. and Marxism. It's I'm trying to force everybody... Shit. It's trying to force everybody to think a certain way, mm -hmm. you know, but I did a lot. I, and, and like I said, we did this, we did the short film. It's about 18 minutes long. It's on YouTube called NAX Crossroads. It's on the NAX Entertainment Channel. And, um, and we were proud of that. I'm in the midst now of filming several movies. I don't know if, uh, you know, I think that I was recommended by the strong man, Tony. Mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yes, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, Tony uh, Cruz. I really like uh, Tony. Huh? He came yeah. here and he was gonna destroy all the studio. <laughs> uh, he could do it too. You see what he does to a frying pan? Everything he try he, with the yellow pages, the frying pan, uh, whatever came to his hands, he just destroyed it. <laughs> So amazingly enough, I got into the acting world um, because of, of the wrestling. Like I've been doing wrestling and before I did wrestling, I did Muay Thai. I also did uh, uh, Taekwondo and acro gymnastics. So I did a, a bunch of different things and I, you know, I'm consistently always doing the same thing. You know, when you do something for 25 years, it's not a hobby. It's a way mm -hmm. of life, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, so how did uh, you start uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, James? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, wait, hold on a second. So a movie director comes and walks into my lobby. I live on 23rd Street and 7th Avenue, right? Movie director walks into my lobby, tells my doorman downstairs, because um, do you got a guy here that's an actor and a wrestler? Right here, there's a guy here that's an actor and a wrestler. He says, hold on, let me see who's upstairs. He calls me up. He says, some guy's looking for you. I said, all right, come downstairs. Hey, how you doing? The guy's looking me up and down. He goes, are you an actor? I, yeah, yeah. I said, I'm, I'm primarily a wrestler, but I've done little acting gigs for people, playing a bouncer or something like that. And uh, he goes, oh, that's all right. He says, do you know who Chuck Wepner is? I says, I know it's an old name, but to be honest with you, I don't, I don't place the face. He says, it's okay if you don't know. It's okay if you don't know. <laughs> Right? He sounded like the guy from um like uh the the bird in uh what the hell is that? Akuma Matata, the Lion King. Like the all bird. right, all right, all right. <laughs> That's the way the voice is the guy, right? So anyway, uh he says, Well, anyway, the deal is this this guy, Chuck Wepner, was known as the Bayonne Bleeder, and he inspired all the Rocky movies. Like he it was made after his life. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a, a very big highs and very big lows. And while Sylvester Stallone was making all this money off of his life story, which he didn't pay him for, this guy was doing time in jail. He was doing this and that. He was a real, you know, his life was a lot more seedier than the Rocky movies. You know, it's like his movie. Would have, so just like in Rocky one, where he goes the distance with Apollo, but he loses uh, Apollo was obviously taken after, character was taken after Muhammad Ali, 
because nobody talked like that at the time. Only Muhammad Ali was like the first trash talker on TV, mm -hmm. sports guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he went the distance with uh, the Bayon Bleeder, Chuck Muhammad, went the distance with Ali. He scored a knockdown on him. Oh, geez. Let me see what this. I'm sorry, bro. All right. This movie called. Okay. So, I, like I was telling you, I did this movie called The Brawler, right? And it's based on the life of Chuck Webner. So, Chuck Webner, he went the distance with Ali. He fought George Foreman and he fought Sonny Liston. And in 1976, in the very first matchup versus a pro wrestler versus a boxer, he fought Andre the Giant in Shea Stadium. Okay. So, I got the role to play Andre the Giant in the movie. Whoa. And I was the first person to ever play Andre the Giant on the big screen. And it was a pretty big deal. Uh, if you get a chance, you can watch it. It's streaming on Netflix. It's called The Brawler. It's starring Zach McGowan, Joe Petlatano, Taryn Manning, Amy Smart, Burt Young. It's got tons and tons of star power in it. And, um, you know, right now I'm about 258, right? Mm -hmm. um, in order to get accepted as the role of Andre the Giant. I had five and a half weeks to gain 46 pounds. Jeez. So I was like 312 pounds, 311 pounds on the day that we shot. And the craziest thing was, is like the more that I started gaining the weight, the more I started looking like Andre the Giant. Anyway, it was crazy. They foofed up my hair and stuff and it really worked out. Mm -hmm. And it, it created a lot of opportunity for me because... <clears throat> The guy who, who got me into that, this guy, Scott, he told me, um, he's like, oh, I get it. You know, you're excited that you, you worked with all these stars, but let me tell you who they're talking about. He says, they're talking about you. They can't believe that you gained 46 pounds to, you know, to do the role justice and the, to bring Andre the Giant to life on the big screen the way you did it. You did a lot of self-sacrifice. If I tell you what I ate, it was disgusting. What was it? Because now <laughs> every every morning, every day, the same food. All right. Ten egg whites, half a loaf of wheat bread, quarter pound of turkey, an avocado, tomato. That's my breakfast. Right. Then I then I go for my first lunch at 12 o'clock to the Spanish Dominican spot here. Rice and beans. Two o'clock. I go back to the Spanish place. Rice and beans again. Then at night. Steak, potatoes, broccoli, bread, ice cream. Every yeah. single day like that, to the point where you're eating food like this. <laughs> That's nasty. Like throwing up. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it was a great, but since then I've been in about 20 movies and I'm in the midst now of, uh, uh, of finishing up uh, this movie called Good Friday, a mob comedy that uh, I, I uh, play the role of a guy named Apollo. Mm -hmm. in it and uh anyway it, it's really cool i'm doing that i'm doing for the love of pizza i'm playing an alien predator in the movie moon rocks and i i get on these things and i i coordinated the the fight scene in the brawler and i coordinate most of these fight scenes when i'm when i'm on set in this movie good friday there's a fight at the wedding and uh, and there's fights at the feasts and stuff like that and i coordinate all of these fights and stuff and uh and I'm, I, I just love being an entertainer. Like That's amazing, James. That's really amazing. I'll give you an example. Like, for example, I'm six foot seven and a half. Legit. That's my size, right? You're Fair huge. Yeah, you're huge. Right. I'm six foot seven and a half inches. So if I tried to blend and be normal, it's impossible. You mm -hmm. understand? God made me this way. I'm big. I stand out. And, you know, I guess my, my calling to is to be it. out there doing things, is to put it in to use, not mm -hmm. really to sitting on the couch and staying at home or play video games. I don't, I don't play games. Mm -hmm. And how, how did it start into wrestling, James? All right. So everybody in Malta, if you don't already know the legend and the pioneer of pro wrestling from the Isle of Malta, it was Baron Mikel Cicluna. Now, the Baron and my father, Tichikuji. All right. And Meta 
in Jail du Awak in Madison Square Garden, I used to come with my dad and my brothers, and he would come out to wrestle. And on the way back, my, my dad would tap him on the shoulder, and then he would bring us backstage, man, in like 1977, 1978, backstage in Madison Square Garden, man. And I was back there, and I met Andre the Giant in real life. And I met the Strongbows and the Wild Samoans. And I seen all these guys walking around. And it was like, it was so interesting to me. It was kind of like a circus, but with, with people that mm -hmm. were extraordinary. Instead of an animal that was rare, it was an extraordinary person. And um, so I loved it. And I used to stay up late every night, uh, every uh Saturday night, or no, Friday night, it would be a um, Friday night main event. It would be on 1130 at night, and it was way past my bedtime. And in order to, to watch it, I had to deal with my dad because he would get in trouble if my mother got up and found us watching wrestling at midnight. So we'd say, listen, this is the deal. You'll get your spanking now in case we get caught. <laughs> so this way I can say I already punished you. I said, oh, okay. So I literally <laughs> would get spanked just to watch wrestling. And then as I was getting older, even before um, before I became a wrestler, at the time I was doing Muay Thai, I was doing Thai boxing. And people would stop me on the street and ask me if I was a wrestler, even before I started training one day, because I just kept getting big. I had this look and and I just, you know, it just I just gravitated towards it. So I first went to a a school called Long Island Wrestling Federation. It was known as the Dog House. The wrestling was a tough wrestling school in New York. And I, I went there for <clears throat> a few months and uh, to learn the basic bumps. And then I asked my, my father to call up the Baron and see if he would accept me to train me as a mentor. And then he said yes. And I went to Pittsburgh and I trained with him. And... Uh, and he beat the living crap out of me, you know? And afterwards, like, I'll give you an example, right? At the time, I think he was in the late 60s, and his legs looked like a 30 years old man. He's on the treadmill every day. He was curling 65-pound dumbbells in his late 60s, all right? And his hands from wrestling was like leather gloves. <laughs> so he put me on the floor in this, like, leg scissor hole, and he bent me over bent over my head forward and he opened up on my back like that Pow! with these chops not handprints that he leave me in between where the fingers are my my skin broke open like like wound you know what i mean like oh wow, yeah it looked like wolverine attacked me on my back and then afterwards he says you know why i did that i says why he says i want to see if you got what it takes because this is not an easy business. Mm -hmm. I said, so what do you think? He says, you got what it takes. <laughs> and if he confirmed it, if he That's said it. so. And, that and, and as far as I, like, I know Bruno Sammartino, Dominic Danucci, Larry Zabisco, all of these great legends. And they love me. And they say, man, if we wish that you would have been in our time, you know? Mm -hmm. So you could train together. Yeah, and and their their um their except you know for for them to say that they would have loved to wrestle me in in their prime is like uh is an appreciation that I can never tell them how much it means to me because I mm -hmm. hold these people in the highest respect they are the people who who created professional they pioneered the sport when mm -hmm. they did it there was a like the rock making millions of dollars or, or John Zena, Roman Reigns, or, you know, they didn't make millions of dollars. They, they, they crammed into little cars, they chipped in and they're paid to get to the next show. Andre the giant was so big. Sometimes they couldn't find a car big enough to put him in. And they'd be driving in the winter time from like, uh, New Jersey to Buffalo. And at that time, man, it could be even 10 degrees out, maybe zero, you know? And they would put Andre in the back of the pickup truck with a blanket, two cases of beer, and three bottles of Jack Daniels. And they get to the show. <laughs> and he keep warm. You know, so did, uh, wrestling is... get is, warm. Is, <laughs> yeah. Wrestling is... Uh, is people, don't, 
people don't understand wrestling, especially in Malta. You know, I, I think that pro wrestling Malta needs to get uh, sponsorship and help from the government because if they would just stop being stupid about professional wrestling, all right? I'm going to lay it down for you right here, right now. And for all your fans around the world and in Malta, all right? Professional wrestling is the hardest thing that I've ever done. It's, it's harder than fighting in the street. It's harder than Muay Thai. It's harder than anything. Like, um, I'm friends with Billy Corrido. You know him? Did you interview him, Billy? No, I didn't. The heavyweight champion of Malta? I haven't yet. All right. But his name Maybe is Billy Corrito. C-O-R-I-T-O. All right? Everybody knows Billy. He has his Corrito's Way boxing training system. And, and he's a legend. You know, he, he's held many championships in England, in Malta, and around Europe. And he's a, t- he's a tough guy. So before there was wrestling in Malta, right? You know, people tell me they 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 tell they don't understand it. They said, "Oh yeah, no, we've seen this SmackDown wrestling, but you know, we don't really respect it, or it's not." I says, "All right." So now let's just say boxing, for instance, right? And I asked Billy. I says, "You're a boxer, right?" He goes, "Yes." I says, "If somebody goes and they go to punch you in the face, are you going to stay there and get punched?" He goes, no, I I can defend twenty different ways to any punch. I said, well, that's the difference. We know the strike is coming, and we walk right into it. We know someone's going to sw- swing a steel chair at us, and we walk right into it, hands down, and take it right on the dome. Mm-hmm. Now, what takes more courage? To avoid the, the punch and try to land your own punch and not get hit? Or, or to literally beat the living crap out of, of each other to entertain people? You know, what's going to do more harm to you over time? So... You know, that's the thing. And like, for example, if I was to grab, let's say you, for example, right? Mm -hmm. And I was to give you a tombstone pile driver and I break your neck and kill you. Are you going to bring your eight-year-old to come and see me? No. Mm -hmm. So, you know, your wife isn't going to have a husband if you're married or your mother's not going to have a son. And it's not legal to go out there and kill people. But people have died in the ring in professional wrestling. I've had a, a whole bunch of injuries that mm-hmm. I've worked through and came back from. And that's, you know, that's the lessons in anything. You know, it's not how many times you get knocked down. It's how many times you get back up and you Jake, never say ha- die, ha- never ha- quit, ha- never give up. Half of them in this Yahzbo, the wrestling or just entertainment. But of the verita, it's, it is entertainment in a way. But at the same time, so is time. boxing is entertainment. Exactly. So is, exactly. So, so so is UFC is entertainment. You mm-hmm. buy a ticket and you go and see it. Mm-hmm. And you want to know what? I'll give you right that too. Boxing is not always the two toughest people in the world fighting. I remember when they were trying to get Julio Cesar Chavez to 100 fights, and they brought Macho Camacho out after 15 years of retirement to come in and fight him when they were two old guys, and the security guys bringing him to the Bringing them to the ring would probably put on a better fight. Mm-hmm. But they were names, they draw a crowd, and there you go. And we see the fights of Tyson recently. Right, right. And, and, and I'm saying, like, I have friends that have become paralyzed in, in doing the stunts in pro wrestling. You know, like, I, I, one time I had a conversation with some guy, and he says, I said, yo, you're going to come to my show? I'm wrestling over here in the Elk Slide. He's like, oh, man, I don't want to go see that wrestling. It's fake, man. But I just came from seeing The Matrix, and that was dope. I said, wait a second. What I do is fake, and The Matrix is dope? I says, The Matrix, they go cut, and then a brave guy comes in and does the stunt. And then I says, we do all of our stunts. We do it live. We do it one time through. It's, it's, it's physically demanding. It, it puts a toll on your body. You get injured. You know, anybody going for, you know, it's the art of taking the fall. Mm-hmm. Fall on your back and tell me how it feels. And then fall on your face and tell me how it feels. It doesn't feel great. There's a certain way to do it so that you don't, you don't crush the disc in your back. But it happens. Not every, in, in, per, in, in pro wrestling, when you don't get a perfect 10, you end up in the emergency room. And the risk is there. And that's what the fans support. That's what the people that's what the people are into. Sometimes the people think, oh, they, they understand the art of pro wrestling. It is a show. It is a show. Mm-hmm. It's an athletic theater. But it's 
high, high risk. And not, it's not for anybody. Not People can't just walk in the ring and be a pro wrestler. James, can you train your a belly show? How many days before? Every day. Every day. Every but, day. But I, I do, you you know, I work out on different, I work out on different things. I, I do my sit-ups and push-ups every day like religion. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Then I do I do my curls, I do my stretching. I hit the, I have a tie bag downstairs. I hit the tie bag, I hit the weights. I was training people how to become a professional wrestler in Queens and in Brooklyn over here on Wednesdays and Mondays, but now I'm not doing that anymore because I, I take care of my mother now. Mm-hmm. And uh so the, you know, that's what you have to it has to be a way of life, you know, but, to get in there. You know what it's like to get body slammed, to get suplexed, to get mm-hmm. superplexed off the top rope. And I'm I'm six foot seven and a half, usually about 265 pounds. And you come crashing down onto your back. And then you still got to get up and fight for another mm-hmm. 10, 12 minutes. You know what I mean? And this is happening throughout the thing. So it's it's a very difficult, difficult thing. And it's a lot harder. You if you're looking with for your reality. Opponent. What? You practice with your opponent. No, no. I mean, no, as, with with everyone. Uh, these opponents fly in. I mean, I don't know if you've seen any of my stuff when you, but I was just in Mexico. I don't even, you know, I don't speak fluent Spanish. I can communicate a little bit, mm-hmm. but you know, if you know what you're doing and the other guy knows what you're doing, you just feel it out in the ring. You know, and what you I mean? do it at that time. At that time, like wow. they may tell you how they want it to start or how they'd like it to finish, but. Mm-hmm. To make the match interesting and entertaining and a little bit different every time is up to you as the performer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's like a musician coming up with a new song and playing it, you know? It's up to you to make it a little bit different every time so it's not the same thing. Mm-hmm. And what happens if uh, at the end the result would be different? <laughs> it, it happens. Could it happen? Could it happen? It did happen. It happens. They, they call them screw jobs. Screw <laughs> <laughs> it happened in Calgary between Shawn Michaels and Brett the Hitman Hart, where All Brett right. was told that he was going to go over, and and McMahon knew it, and he told the referee to take a fast count, oh. and he put over Shawn Michaels, and you know that stuff happens, it, and and sometimes some other guy is supposed to end the match and he keeps going, keeps going. Well, they 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 cut the match. You only have your time out there, you know. Quarta and Dom Chance James, what? 15 minutes they have as, well, as a normal, as a normal fight. For an hour. You know, like in, in, in the Baron's day, the Baron Sakuna's day, mm-hmm. it, it was an average match was an hour. Now they call it an hour long match, an Iron Man match. Whoa. But back then they did they really didn't jump off the ropes. It was mainly grappling and holds and you know, a mixture of like Aikido and Jiu-Jitsu and wrestling together. You know, it was more a grappler quest. You know, lista mina liriti kollo ki asha haja impressionanti. Scusi? Lista mina liriti kollo ki asha haja kbira. Yeah. You have to have a good stamina. Sure. Of course. <laughs> And if it's you a, have... like I said, it's it's amazing what the 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 training is is really amazing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's not for anybody. Some people say you got to be crazy to do wrestling, you know, to be falling on your back and beating yourself up like that. But it's a passion, you know, it's for what we do. It's in art. Like years ago, they used to have uh, the martial art films where they're like you, you kill my brother. I kill you. You know, and then the, <laughs> the mouth is moving and, and it's, it's speaking in Chinese, but they have the <laughs> in, in English. <clears throat> but that's the same thing. It, it, those guys are doing a stunt show, a live stunt show. And that's kind of what wrestling has evolved into. It's evolved in from a grappler's sport into a high impact stunt show. I mean, sometimes you watch wrestling and you see very little wrestling in it. And people jumping off the ropes, doing flips, doing that. Where's all the grappling? You know, mm-hmm. my favorite part is the combination between is the person who can grapple and do the high flying and modern day stuff where people were like, when I, I learned the grappling way, I never wanted to be a choke slam power bomb wrestler. But when people look at you and they, they see a Kevin Nash or they see the undertaker, when they see you, they call out 
Tombstone, chalk slam. So you end up doing it anyway, you know, mm-hmm. because that's what the people want to see. And at the end of the day, you want to give the people what they're paying to see because they're the ones that is buying the tickets. And do you do you do like the behind the scenes, James? Like normally when we see either SmackDown or Raw, they also bring the behind the scenes stuff that happens, like the story of how they got uh, into to fight each other. Do you do it? Yeah. I mean, there's always something from the last show that's leading up to the next show. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a storyline that people f- like, uh, like, a uh, like example, that's why this movie I did NAX Crossroads is such an interesting thing because it takes a look at these wrestlers outside of the arena. Cause okay. you would think that the whole wrestling world just starts in the back locker room and then it ends in the ring and then they go back to the locker room and it's over. Mm-hmm. So this movie that we did that accentuates the characters in my wrestling federation, um, it gives you a more in-depth look into their character, into the type of lives that they live, but it's more centered around their gimmick, not their actual life, you know? Mm-hmm. 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 And, and it uh, takes you outside the arena, which I think is a, is a good thing. Gili kont interessat bix tithol ma SmackDown jewro? Oh, yeah, I had a couple of opportunities. All right, in... Um, First of all, I'm, I have, um, I was married for 22 years and I have two kids, you know, and uh, over here in the States, you have to maintain health care, you have to maintain stuff. Otherwise, you know, you can't even put your kids in school if you don't have that, you know, and at that time, uh, these companies like WWE, they wouldn't provide you with health care, you know, you would, you go and you have to handle your injuries on your own type of deal. And uh, so they had a, a, a show on MTV called Tough Enough. Do you remember it? Um, Tough Enough. It was, a, it was a kind of thing where they took, you know, a police officer or somebody who had a dream to be a wrestler and they put them in. So I sent in my tape because I thought it was a competition where I'm going to meet someone and wrestle somebody for a job at WWE. And it turned out that it was a reality show and you have to live in the house with the people for six months. And that opportunity came to me just as I got promoted to being a supervisor on my job. Mm-hmm. And uh, I wasn't going to take a chance with su- the livelihood of supporting my family and go to the WWE at that time. So I said no. So then in 2004, I was really popular. And uh, I got a call from a guy uh, named Jody Hamilton. And he was a recruit for the WWE. And uh, they wanted to recruit me and send me to the old WCW power plant in Georgia and develop me as a professional wrestler. And they had, uh, they had gave me a, a really good offer. They wanted to match the money I was making on my job and then, and then go to live in Georgia. But at that time, my wife's mother had gotten, uh, my ex-wife anyway, but her, her mother had gotten a rare form of breast cancer. I mean, I'm not going to take her only daughter and and the grandkids and moved to Georgia, you know, to chase a wrestling dream, you know, so I didn't take it either. And then they called me back and they 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 offered me even more money. But I just said they said, well, you got to make a decision what you want to do. At the time, they were developing Ted DiBiase Jr. and Cody Rhodes. They said, we're doing a lot with with second generation wrestlers. We think it'd be great. And I said, well, thanks for the offer, but I think I, I made my choice a long time ago when I decided to get married and have kids, you know, mm-hmm. I know so many wrestlers that, you know, are on the road all the time. They didn't, they was never there for their daughter's birthday or for their son's uh, football game or soccer game, you know, and then as a result that they, they have no family, the family leaves them. And so you have fame, but you don't have your family, mm-hmm. but you know, I I've, been trying to do my best to balance both for a long time and i know i know it's like a private question though is it is it good money uh okay when we see like the rock because you mentioned the rock before you mentioned uh, uh, the rock is one of the highest paid entertainers in the world mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. yes it is but 
the it's like anything else all right it's like playing the lotto is it where the risk i mean like uh, mentioning all the injuries that could happen uh Man, your career right could... over here I, got, i had a torn bicep on my arm here i don't know if you can see the scar but i have a big scar that goes over here like this mm -hmm. and i had to put over here my my bicep shot up into my underarm they had to fish it out and then suture it into my thing here and i came back I came back strong from that. I broke my collarbone in two places. I dislocated my shoulder. I've had teeth knocked out of my mouth. And I'm going to tell you 100% it's worked. And it's not, I don't, I don't expect anybody to understand that statement because you have to be in love with something to understand that. How many people stay with their wives, even though they put them through hell, right? <laughs> so I put myself through, through yeah. hell in the ring and I'm still in love with wrestling. Does that make sense? It does. <laughs> uh, you came with the perfect answer, Ostro. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, after, well, Mela, um, you were you were wrestling. How did it come into doing acting? There, there are like when doing wrestling, there is uh, a little bit of acting also that goes on. Yeah, there is. There is exactly. How, how it's called. It it's called selling. It's called selling the move. You know. How did it and come? You, like... there, there is the acting involved because you want to get that audience behind you. So, so you reach out to them to help you get up off the floor. You reach it out to the to the person in the sixth row to to help you get out of this lock. You know, mm -hmm. and they feel by them rooting and getting behind you gives you the strength to get out of it to break mm -hmm. free of this of these moves. And how did you how did you like uh, take it more serious the, how did you take it more more serious the acting bit how did it come into place well it's just that these people are telling me you know i know you're excited about rest i mean about being on the set with all these actors but all these actors are talking about you they're mm -hmm. talking about how interesting it is that you're a professional wrestler how in, in real life like these most actors they just play the role of whatever they're there to play. You know, mm -hmm. in real life, they're just playing another role. Mm -hmm. So they found it fascinating that I was there. They said, you're big enough that if you want, you could be a jerk, but you're not a jerk. You're a nice mm -hmm. guy. You're a gentleman. You show up early, you leave late. Mm -hmm. And that's my work ethic and everything that I do. You know, I'm, I'm in it to win it, man. I'm not, I, I don't, I don't get involved in things, uh, for trivial like. purposes. I, I get in charge. Mm -hmm. You know, I get involved in things because I start things, I finish them, I get things done, I'm reliable, and uh, and I put my heart into everything that I do. So people like that, and they they like me, and they say, and and all of these acting gigs, I I don't go on auditions for them. People contact me on Facebook, or they get my number from someone, and we say we got the role for you, we got it, we want to use you, and I just go there and I do it. You know. Mm -hmm. And do you do you write your own stories for uh, for when it comes to wrestling? Was there a, uh, an idea of yours that maybe the company that you that you used to work for um, did it didn't realize that you maybe for example you had this good story to sell for people watching? Yeah, I mean, there's all like I said, it's always a. Uh... It's like Batman, man. There's a villain. There's a hero. You know what I mean? There's a battle between the two. You don't know who's going to win it. You know, that's kind of like, it's it, and like, um, but I'm but a writer. You know, I, I wrote and directed and produced the NAX Crossroad piece. Mm -hmm. And I'm currently writing a sitcom at the moment. So I have a, and I, growing up in New York, I was also a graffiti writer. Hmm. I was a graffiti writer. I was into hip hop. I was into um, punk rock. And I was into all these different things that were involved in, in, in the city. And um, and anyway, it's just like I'm, I'm in a, a centrally located place and there's a lot of things going on. So, you know, you have your reputation that you do things, you get things done and that you're reliable, that you're an honest person. And then more things come your way. Like I said, right now, I, I really got a lot of great opportunities. I just was filming the, the other day, this movie for the love of pizza. We're going to film the last day of shooting uh, for the good Friday, a mob comedy. I got the other 
uh, movie that I'm doing, Moon Rocks. I was just on this uh, on a film festival in a show called Big Time, where I play a strong man in the circus. And uh, you Who's know, I like all these different. They're all different, very different. One's Andre the Giant, the other one's a strong man in the circus, the other one's a gang, a gang movie. This one's a mob movie. You know, one time I played a Gulf War veteran in a movie. So I'm also in this short film. It's up on YouTube too, called Kill Street, where I play a killer in that movie. I did another movie called uh, The Reunion, where I, I also play like a hillbilly killer in that one. Like Which a, parts do you like doing most? Uh, be, being a villain or being uh, a regular guy, let's say, like, uh, or a love story or whatever? No, well, I'll tell you, it's, I, 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 love, I love being able to, to do different things. I don't want to get stuck in, in a box. You know, mm -hmm. I love being the hero and I love being the villain. It depends what kind of crowd I'm in front of. Mm -hmm. Like when I go to Malta, with big time faces because most of the damage are there. Mm -hmm. If I come over and I was just in, uh, in uh, Philadelphia and over there, I was a bad guy, you know? Mm -hmm. So sometimes we're good. Sometimes we're bad. Like when I do the tag team with Wayne, we're called the Maltese Marauders and, and we're pretty badass dudes, you know? <laughs> and how, so, how did the, uh, the name come, the damage air? Somebody gave it. Oh, to all right. So listen, you, so like I, like I tell you, I grew up here in New York and I used to go, a lot of guys in my neighborhood used to play this punk rock, hardcore music and down in CBG beats, you know? So I used to go there because there was like five bands from my neighborhood alone. And, uh, and we used to go and support them in the mosh pit, you know? And I actually get credited with innovating slam dancing as well from guys that used to just bang their head and bump shoulders and do floor walks into actually a fight dance. Because at that time, people were swinging chains in the mosh pit, hammers, blackjacks. So in order to keep these people away from me, I would be like throwing kicks <laughs> and punches and it became like a fight dance. And because I was a big dude and I used to stand up for myself and for my friends, you know, uh, and if I go into a mosh pit, I'd be like, there'd be a huge hole there because nobody wants to come near me, right? <laughs> so. And I was from Malta. So the people of that punk rock scene named me Malta the Damager. So I kept that name because I'm from, you know, I'm Maltese and I blip people up. You know what I mean? <laughs> If they come into your way, you'll damage them. <laughs> yeah, I'll take them out. No problem, man. Whether it's you or 10 people or 20 people, 50 people behind you, bro. I'm not backing down from nobody. If, if, Um, James, if you take like when you're a stunt coordinator, it's the same thing as wrestling. Is it? Um... Well, it's actually not. The, the thing why it's been working out for me is because I call up my friends that are wrestlers and I have them come in and do the stunts because the actors cannot do what the wrestlers can do. You know, no. their bodies can't take getting thrown through a table. They can't take actually getting hit with a strike. You got, you got to try to hit them this way and get it from a certain camera angle. And it's mainly all of this stuff. You know what I'm saying? But uh, yeah, actors and wrestlers are two different things. But, you know, we, we do it on a, on, a, on a full contact level. You know, like people don't realize how stiff they are. If I got this big ass hand that I got right here, right? And I gave you one of these chops on your chest. Your chest is going to be glowing. My handprint is going to be like that you know, mm -hmm. flaring up off the chest. I mean, it takes a lot. You know, you get kicked in your head, you get kicked in your back. If you don't make contact, people say, oh, boo, it's fake, you missed them. You got to make some type of contact. But in, in generally in movies with actors, they don't like to make any contact, you know, unless they're a martial artist or somebody who has some type of experience fighting. And uh, because you have lots of, you do lots of things, James. How much I also fight? sing in the cover band, bro. I sing CCR. Really? Yeah. My father's favorite ba band. I put a spell on you. <laughs> because you're <laughs> you you do I, love I do. I, I just love I just love I'm not a couch potato. I want to be out there doing something on you're, a stage in nice. a ring, on a set. You know, that's my life, man. Entertainment. And I do it because I love to do it. Yes, I make money doing it, 
but I also have a regular job, you know, mm -hmm. uh, where I'm a superintendent of 122 unit condominium. A lot of, a lot of, uh, Maltese people are supers here in the city <laughs> and, uh, but it's a good job. You know, that's, and, and, and I do, as soon as I clock out at five, boom, I start everything else. You know, I start mm -hmm. chasing my passions and my dreams and I do this for my slow and steady, you know, because like I says, your livelihood shouldn't be a risk. It shouldn't be a gamble. You always have to have your plan, your dream and your backup plan. Yeah, definitely. And how much do you have? How much fights do you have, James? Like, let's take a month, a month. How much fights? Well, do you know listen, you right now I'm 50 years old, so I don't take bookings like I used to. But in my prime when I was doing it, um, because I work a full time job, I would work, you know, three to four shows on the weekend, sometimes two shows a day. You'd be wrestling a show in New Jersey and you got to make it out to Long Island, New York to wrestle by nine o'clock you coming out there wow. you know so like that it was about you know generally anywhere from two to four shows a week wow incredible and have you ever been contact uh, contacted from a maltese person who would like to come there and start wrestling yes i mean that's where this is a hundred percent like um that's how me and wayne Wayne Potch, Johnny Valletta. That's how we met. We met through wrestling. Uh, we knew a mutual friend. He and, came there, uh, James. At, what? He came there, Johnny? Yeah, yeah, he came here. Uh, okay, okay. But he was first, he was training in uh, England mm -hmm. under this guy, uh, somebody Jones, right? It was his trainer there. And, uh, and then, you know, he came to Malta and and, and then I told him when I came to Malta, because I, I was a part of the very first wrestling event that we did in Malta in Monte Cristo. And uh, there was many fans that showed up there that had been following me from Malta for years. That everybody, they, they like it, you know. Like, you, I don't know if people understand the difficulty of doing something the way that I do it. Like, let's just say if all you are is a professional wrestler, that's it. You have a sponsor, you have a big company, you're getting big checks. You don't have to do nothing. All you got to do is get up and train, jog, eat well, work out, look in the gym, take some selfies, you know. But me, man, I, I work at a full-time job. And, and then I also do renovations, mm -hmm. you know, plumbing, carpentry, electrical work. You know, at the same time, I'm, I'm training. At the same time, I'm a father and a family man. And I'm taking my kids camping and I'm going to all of their events and throwing parties. And so it's, I, I think it's a lot more difficult and, and to do it the way that I've been doing it, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, like I says, I do make money, but it's not enough to, to support the lifestyle that I have. You know? <laughs> so well, I, how, how do you relax James? Have sex. Oh. And then afterwards go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the relaxing time that you have. The only relaxing time is that sex and sleep. That's it. <laughs> oh, unless when I came to Malta, man, after the show was over, I, I was like, you know, I go down to by the sea, lay down on the rock. I don't even need a towel, bro, like a caveman, all right? And I just sit there and I listen to the ocean and I have a little meditation going on, which is something that Wayne taught me to do and, and it really works you know he learned about meditation in, in uh in japan and and it's nice just uh, something like that where you could just keep your mind blank even if it's just for five minutes or ten minutes you know and just take in you know just the sounds of nature and that's it so that also helps me relax as well but i'm not meant to relax man i'm meant to keep going don't forget man i'm 50 years old if i if i relax now I started to decline, man. I got to push harder now than I ever did before in my life. How did you find meditation helping you, though? Because uh, it's good to clear your mind. When your mind is constantly running, you know, you, you can't relax. So to just to take a few minutes out of your day for yourself, even like what I was doing for myself all year since, you know, I, I've been... For instance, we had this, this pandemic, right? People mm -hmm. didn't do nothing. I'm filming movies. I'm writing movies. 
I, I wrestled in Mexico twice. Uh, me and Wayne were just in Mexico about three months ago. Then we went to Malta together. I wrestled in Puerto Rico. I was in Malta. You know, I'm not meant to relax, man. I'm meant to just keep going. Uh, and uh, James, um, uh, when you go to, like, for example, you went to Mexico. Um, uh, you, you mentioned Johnny went to Japan. Is there a difference in style when it comes to oh, rest- yes. completely different though? Or uh... that's why you know that's why also you know uh Gianni Gianni Valletta he wanted to go to Mexico because when I went down there I said, dude, you gotta come here because the training here is so different, the style is so different. Like I'll give you an example. In America, they take a lot of bombs and bumps and stuff like that. In the lucha, it's mainly hop, jump up, over the roll, twist, roll. You're rolling out of the moves, and it, it's it's a lot different. But um, that's why, you know, Pro Wrestling Malta and uh, Johnny Valletta, who runs it, is uh, is such a, a blessing for anybody who has a dream of being a wrestling at Malta because you're getting a whole world of experience. He came here to America with me three times. We did tours in America all over. Uh, from here to Florida, you know, and um, he, he's been in Japan. He's been in about 12 different countries in Europe, UK and Mexico. So when you go into pro wrestling Malta, you're getting that, a whole world of knowledge, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, and that, that you can't even get that, you know, like you go up to places and they just know a certain way. Like if you go to Mexico, you're going to learn the Mexican way. You go to Japan, you learn the Japan way, mm-hmm. you know, Japan And uh, I got an award in Mexico for being one of the top full contact fighters in the world. Whoa. Hold on, I'll show it to you. Hold on. This is a very prestigious award from uh, Mexico. Wow, well done. Yeah, it was awesome, man. They, they, they really, lo- I, I told them, I says, you know, I'm... Um, uh, descendant of, of Baron Mikhail Sukluna, and I played Andre the Giant in the movie. They, they get it twisted. They say, oh, he's Andre the Giant's descendant. So no, I played him in the movie. Oh, it's incredible. Baron Sukluna is my uncle mentor type of deal. That's incredible. But uh, whatever. They, if they want to think I'm Andre's nephew, let them think it. <laughs> And how, how, how did the wrestling start? Uh, uh, it was like uh, something friends started together or what's the what's the history about about wrestling well wrestling it goes all the way back to the first olympics wrestling you know where they would do greco-roman wrestling and you would you would grab somebody in a roman grip like this arm on arm and you'd have to wrestle the guy down that's that's generally how it started but i could tell you why it turned into what it is today is because vince mcmahon His father's Vince Sr., right? Mm-hmm. So he's, he's the one who started it, Vince Sr. And McMahon wanted to be a soap opera actor himself. And he felt trapped in the wrestling business because of his family. Therefore, he changed wrestling into a freaking soap opera. Oh. Athletic stunt show soap opera. And that's what it is now. Jeez. And it's a very entertaining show. You can't argue with the numbers. You can't argue with the success. Mm-hmm. You know? And, but what what makes uh, UFC though? Because uh, UFC is quite quite recent compared to wrestling. Yeah, I mean, why, why do UFC. You think it's, it's this more, is where more things are getting kind of twisted now, because mm-hmm. UFC became popular by copying the marketing strategy of professional wrestling. Because I did Muay Thai, which is like UFC, right? We grapple, clinch, take down, strike. All right. And it was illegal. They, you couldn't do it in New York. You couldn't do it in New Jersey. When we used to do it, it would look like there's a nail salon upstairs. Right. I'm sorry. Somebody tried to call me. No it looked like there was a nail salon upstairs or something. Right. And then you go up there and it was a full fledged dojo being run by this Russian fighter, Oleg Taktara. Hold, hold a moment, please. Scusi, hey, who perchance, yeah? 
<laughs> in Kolo Ido, look at mobile. My phone never stops going, bro. <laughs> if, even your mobile is busy like you all the time. It is, it is. It never stops. <laughs> And That's too. what this is now. The mobile is the work you never get away from now. That's Before, it. when you used to leave work and go home, now you bring the work home with you with the phone. Oh, it's true. It's true. It keeps on going, right? Yeah. Who's, who's your uh, ideal, let's say, for you, he's like the god of wrestling? For me, Baron Cicluna is my god of wrestling because he was the guy who motivated me to 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 watch professional wrestling but there's many wrestlers that are out there that I really love the way that they work like if you look at that some guys that are out there today um there's so many there's so many guys that are out there like that are really really good uh for example uh, Finn Balor is really good wrestler uh Roman Reigns very good the Usos Anybody who comes from the Samoan bloodline, they're going to be great wrestlers. I wrestled against Lance, the future Anoa'i. That's uh, Samu from the Head Shrinker's son. And he's really a great wrestler. I mean, it was like wrestling air. I didn't feel this guy. Everything that he did was sharp, was clean, was fast and safe. So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I love The Undertaker is like one of the gods of wrestling for me too. I mean, it's for most people, he had just the... Uh, Athletic, big, tough, you know, and a lot of the stuff that I try to be myself. Him. People look at him like uh, he's the face of, of wrestling goals. So sometimes when they... Well, when he they... was like, they would say he was the big dog in the locker room. He was like, even before Hunter Helmsley asked out Stephanie McMahon, he asked the Undertaker for permission. Can I ask out Stephanie? Oh, well. Wow. So, yeah, he was the big dog, you know. He got a lot of respect. It's just kind of like, you know, like somebody in your neighborhood that's a tough guy mm-hmm. and a good person and, and you know, uses his size and ability for good things and not to bully people. But Undertaker is just a phenomenal wrestler. And what was... Uh, how, how did Chic Luna go into wrestling you know a bit about his background yeah i know about it so he went um he came to america right i think they found him in malta uh and then uh they brought him here to be to to be, train to be a, a wrestler and then when mcmahon senior found out about him he sent him to calgary in canada to Stu hart the dungeon and Stu hart to train up there Before, I think maybe Bret Hart was like a baby at that time. And, uh, and yeah, then he, he, he wrestled. He was the main event. I'm going to show you some stuff. Wait, hold on. Okay. <laughs> so uh, he pioneered professional wrestling. He was one of the top contenders in the world. He was uh, uh, a multi-time, multi, multi-time heavyweight champion. Uh, he also uh, was number one contender in Fort uh, Bruno San Martino for the, for the heavyweight title. And he headlined in Boston Garden, Madison Square Garden, and many places, the Baltimore Civic Center. Um, also uh, headlining in Australia, all around the world, England, this and that. And uh, yeah, he was just a man. I, I love him, man. He was like... Whoa. You have all his memorabilia then. Yeah, I have a lot of memorabilia and stuff. Uh, you have over here. This is from the also. movie I did. All right. And then this is the actual program from the Ali Chuck Webner fight. All right. And this one here is an autographed picture by Chuck that we got on the set doing the movie. And I was tag team partners with Viscera. You remember him from WWE? I forgot his name, though. It was Viscera. Viscera? Viscera was his Viscera. name during that gimmick with the yellow hair and the, and the contacts. And before that, he was known as Mabel, Men on a Mission. Uh, I have it. To be honest, no, no I haven't watched. Uh, well, all right, Empire State Champion. Uh, you, ha- you have. Yeah, man. But I, I, I appreciate, you know, that you take the time to 
interview me and and uh, that your viewership in Malta will will know more about me, what I do on my own out of out of the love of professional wrestling and the affection and the love that I have for Malta and the Maltese people is unrivaled. You know that. It was my pleasure, James. It was my pleasure. Uh, I would like to thank you, Tony, for uh, for m- making me uh, know more about wrestling. And he got me into contacting you so we could do this interview. I know I was That's speaking right. a little Tony bit Farouk Maltese because I know Mr. you understand cool. Maltese. Tony and Mr. Cool, these guys are uh, have literally their their superhuman strength. They they have this old system, this old way of training, lifting stones and pulling tractor trailers and all this wild stuff that they do. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, there's so many talented Maltese uh, athletes, strong men, soccer players, boxers. We do everything, the Maltese, man. <laughs> we have hidden thank valley. you. Thank you for shining the light on us, man. <laughs> it was my pleasure. And I would like you to say hello to all the Maltese who live there. Oh. <laughs> Ciao, see you. Grazie, James. Ciao. Il podcast. Essa, il podcast.